morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sam. I'm uh, with the Human Salvation of Canada team. We are in uh, southern Ontario. We uh, live in Kitchener. My wife was over there. There she is. My wife and I. We uh, uh, are privileged to get to be with you and to worship the Lord with you and to continue our worship as we worshipfully consider God's Word. And uh, I'd like to uh, look at a passage from the Gospel of John. But maybe just a little intro um, to, to us uh, coming down the 401 uh, this way from Kitchener. I had to think of those drives when I was a kid. I uh, grew up in a German family, an uh, immigrant family that accepted a pastor. My dad was a pastor in Alberta and then uh, in Kitchener for many years. And so on occasion, there would be this, we call it pulpit exchange. And so the pastor that was here at Reach, it wasn't called that at the time, he would go to Kitchener and my dad would come here. And sometimes I would get to come and uh, worship in this uh, house uh, with the people here. And I, so I, it was kind of cool today to think a little bit, wow, um, that was last millennium actually, all of that. So <laughs> to get to come and worship with you was somehow special to me, touched my heart. Um, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, let's look at uh, the Gospel of uh, John. If you do have your Bibles, it um, will also be obviously the basis for uh, the small groups or the, the breakout groups later on and when we have uh, time to interact uh, in smaller groups. Uh, so maybe it's worth <coughs> open. It's uh, just uh, seven verses there, John 12, uh, starting at verse 20. <coughs> slides here. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. That's in Jerusalem. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. <coughs> anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. <clears throat> I wonder how the Son of Man could be glorified through this text and what he's shared here with his friends, through this picture of a kernel. And I think through this picture we get a, a unique, maybe, I hope, a better understanding of who Jesus is through this natural phenomenon that he chooses <coughs> to convey some very interesting spiritual lessons to us. You know, you think of a seed, it's so small, you could flick it and shoot it away, and even in that act, you wouldn't see it anymore. It's so insignificant. And yet, there's so much potential in a little seed. I uh, last year went to uh, a Mennonite um, market. Maybe you've been there, St. Jacob's. Yes. And uh, they've got great houses there. Love it. Yes, and, they do. Yeah. It's not always necessarily cheaper. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. <coughs> I saw these big garlic, and I'll just admit to you, our family loves garlic, and I'm so thankful my wife doesn't just tolerate it, but enjoys it with us. Amen. Yes. We cook with garlic. We, Amen. Yeah. And so we bought these huge, a whole sleeve of huge garlic, and I planted it last year, around this time, and it was a kind of a throwaway idea. I hardly believed in what I was doing. We have, we have a, 
the rent of the little property in Kitchener, and there's a couple spots that I just plunked it in, even like right beside the building wall, and like yeah. no no care, and completely forgot them. Mm -hmm. I forgot them, and garlic grew, and we were like, what are these weeds? Mm -hmm. this, this spring, we started pulling them out. I saw my wife, she was pulling them out, because we had these invasive other things that looked a little similar, and we started pulling, and then I remembered what I did in the fall. Mm -hmm. And these little garlics started making these gorgeous, bright green plants, Amen. and then obviously we stopped yanking them, and <laughs> we let them grow, it was amazing. And from this year's crop, mm -hmm. I now, with more conscious effort, have planted them again. Mm -hmm. And I'm amazed by plunking this thing four or five inches in the ground, and it has power to come out, survive a winter, mm -hmm. imagine that, yep. freeze all through whatever Canada's winter offers, mm -hmm. and come out the other side with green leaves and something to enjoy. I, I'm amazed by that. And that's, that's God's creativity. Amen. To put in something so uh, seemingly small uh, and, and engender it with such uh, potential to grow. I don't know if you've uh, done that experience with wheat. I didn't grow up on a farm. I do. You do. I don't know if it's always the case, but the internet says one kernel of wheat yields like 50 kernels on a stock like that. Mm -hmm. That's 1 to 50. That's kind of pretty cool, actually, if you can do that with your bank account. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, but Jesus uses this picture here and applies it to himself. Jesus is like a perfect seed. And yet, he could be perfect just in and of himself, mm -hmm. or he could undergo something similar to what happens to a seed to produce completely different results. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things of Christian theology is this concept of, of the Trinity. It, it's not our idea. God has presented himself. He lets us call him Father, and he sends of himself, he sends his son, and by his spirit, he's present even now. Mm -hmm. And in and of himself, he didn't need people, he didn't need to create anything to be amazing and to be complete. Mm -hmm. But here, we see God, in the person of his son, does something extra mm -hmm. that costs. So I want to look at that a little bit and meditate on that. And I hope it motivates us as we think about how this might apply to our lives. God has a plan that always has been one mm -hmm. to have fellowship and relationship with people. Amen. And this little demonstration he does with his friends mm -hmm. links into that. A kernel. Through Jesus' life and his teaching, personal conversations, he demonstrated that he cares about people. Mm -hmm. His love and acceptance and his wisdom goes so far beyond anything that the people of those days had ever encountered, and frankly, we haven't gotten better with our collection of wisdom. We've collected knowledge, but life wisdom is still in short supply. God's plan went even further than those days of 2,000 years ago when he sat with his friends and shared about this. God's plan was one of multiplication. <clears throat> but Jesus uses this concept to demonstrate a kingdom principle. God wants to multiply his influence. That's a part of when we talk about God as King of kings, he wants to reign in people's lives. He wants to reign in this world in a way that people willingly enjoy his reign, his good leadership in their lives. And it had to be through the principle we see 
in this seed, unless, our text says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So the kernel demonstrates to us a principle that through death, there is multiplication. Something that wouldn't have been there had this not occurred. Multiplication through the death of the seed itself. I remember as a kid, as a pastor's son, you'd have to hear a lot of sermons over the years. And we were a bilingual church, so I was often in the German service, and then an hour later in the English service, I'd hear it double, I'd hear different forms, I'd be in Sunday school, I'd grow up hearing it all. And this passage always filled me with a little bit of melancholy and sadness. Because the seed dies. Mm -hmm. it, it's weird. I don't know if you sense that. I, I don't want to dwell on it forever. It's just a little seed. Mm -hmm. But it's not just any seed. And it's not just any fruit. Mm -hmm. But it had to die. The seed kind of had to sacrifice itself mm -hmm. for a greater good. So who is Jesus? I think Jesus in this text is the self-sacrificial Lord who out of love gives of himself. He pays a great price. It's a multiplier principle that applies to his friends and his enemies. Scripture tells us Jesus died for his friends. In John 15, I don't know if you have the passage here, it's coming up maybe. Um, Jesus lays down his life for his friends when he preached and he explained to them, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. And that's nice. That's powerful. That somebody would esteem somebody like you or me to give their life for. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. But Jesus' love is sort of breaks all the moments because he we also see in scripture that he died for his enemies. In Romans uh, 5 8, we have, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. While we were still in a state of animosity and, and rebellion against him who made us, he died for us. He didn't wait for some invitation by religious people or something to do something on their behalf. He goes and pays the ultimate price and he pays it forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is a gospel message meant for the whole world anyone who has ears to hear and a heart to accept. I don't know if you know the Liebenzell sort of global model that we have as a mission. It's from 1 uh, Timothy 2 verse 4. For God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants all men, obviously, in the sense of the name kind, all men, women, and children, anyone who has ears to hear, to be saved, and to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what he wants. Mm -hmm. That's what he's always wanted. Mm -hmm. This has always been his desire, always been his plan, even in the days of old, long before Jesus came. Amen. Mm -hmm. So just to pause for a moment, as we hear all of this, that Jesus pays a price for people, we meditate a little bit on this picture of a seed that has to die to yield fruit. Who are some of those people you know that don't know this plan of God, this act of God in Jesus giving his life, paying a price out of love? Who do you know that doesn't know that? 
That's the gospel. Jesus proves his love to the greatest extent by his self-sacrificial dying on the cross. Through his death, through the resurrection, and I find in many circles we almost forget that through his ascension, where he was seated on the throne now, and reigns now as the one who is alive, through all that he's proved his love. And he can prove it again to you personally, today and forever. Jesus says in verse 25 of our text something that kind of places what he's saying as a model for us. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, he says. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I think there's a model in there, maybe with some caveats. I don't think God is calling any of us to think that we could die on a cross to save someone else, or die in some other magic way to save other people. He has, on some sad occasions, requested this ultimate price from people. If you look through history, we are so blessed to live in a country that has great freedom and typically doesn't demand this of us. Maybe a reputation sometimes, maybe a laugh or a snicker, maybe sometimes a refusal for a job. We don't typically end up having to pay with our lives as Christians, but some places that is a potential outcome. I think Jesus does challenge us to think that we too, as his followers, may need to pay a price on occasion. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't love his life more than us. Jesus didn't prioritize staying alive and evading the soldiers in that night, avoiding participation in his heavenly Father's plan of salvation of the world, avoiding the steps required to get at the root of our problem as mankind, as people. He didn't. He kind of hated his life. We often stumble over this word, I do too. But it seems that hate here doesn't mean what we read in social media. It's not a hatred of, of anger, of despising. God is not anti-joyful living doesn't want us to walk around with moldy faces and, and just sort of depressing demeanor. Mm -hmm. But I think here he talks about hating in the sense of prioritizing things right. Mm -hmm. And if you think you can hang on to this life you've given, we're all here 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, we don't hold on to this gift of life forever. Mm -hmm. We think we can. We think that our pursuits are going to be the, the end of all things, the, the culmination of everything amazing. We got it wrong. We got the priorities wrong. Mm -hmm. He hated his life in this world in the sense that he yielded his life to make eternal life for us possible. And I think in that sense, he challenges his followers. He challenges them to hate their lives in this world, to not let their own purposes be their absolute number one priority. What does that look like for you? I don't even know if the conversation groups later on <coughs> resolve that. In a way, I think we need to take this 
and, and listen to the Lord and invite Him to exercise His reign, His kingship, and to help us sort that out in our lives? What does it mean for us to give the purposes of God number one priority? What does that look like? And that's going to be very different for each one of us. We may hang on to certain things more tightly than others. That may not even make sense to some of us how our priorities have been sorted in our own lives. And much of that might be connected with our biography or just natural inclinations. Things we saw at home or that we learned from an uncle or an aunt or something. And, and that might just be our human constitution. But the question, what is our priority as we ask that before him who gave his life for us? That's going to be interesting. That's almost a little risky to ask a question like that. Do you know what I mean when I say it's risky to ask God what should my priorities be in this life? That's a scary question because you let go of some control there. Instead to live a life based on the priorities that God helps us see that's an exciting journey. He did all of this out of love. So loving the right things, the right people, that could be an adequate response on our part. Learning to love what is God's priorities. And I guess that leads into that topic that he talks about here, about service. God wants us to serve him to be available for his good purposes. One of the things I connect with my mom is uh, the German word would be wixy. I don't know, in the broadest sense, maybe a circumspect way of being. She notices when somebody's down. She sees it from a mile away. She looks like right through the crowd and she knows. Or she sees when somebody feels excluded, maybe. Or, and it's this, this willingness to let that move you and to be available for that moment. That's something that I just, I'm amazed by. I feel like I'm much, I'm much more callous or, or skinned somehow. But this sensitivity, this compassion, to be able to be moved, right? And I, and I wonder a little bit, like, can I learn that? Can I learn what Jesus demonstrates here and, and shows us in this picture? This, this sacrificial love? This willingness to pay a price for the God who made me? Can, I, can we learn that? Is that actually learnable? Or is this kind of like a unique character trait of Jesus that I wondered a little bit about that. Like, is the rest of the application of this sort of for us to maybe to grow in, in our character? But after all the sermons you've heard in your life, or the bits and tidbits of humanity that you've heard, I want to look at the section, the thing that is titled, um, yeah, we talked about the model, the fact that this is like a missions text. Why do I say that? I think this is like a global missions text. Because something interesting happens in it. I'll try to explain, at least from my perspective. In a sense, when you read scripture, also in particular how the New Testament sees the Old Testament, it talks about people that have been saved by Christ and including them in a big family, in a global family. The New Testament calls believers children of Abraham. Now, Abraham is person way back in history 
many thousand years back. And he had an interesting occurrence. It says in Genesis 15, let me just switch to that. Get a picture of the stars here, because God gives him a little object lesson in those days. Abraham and Sarah, they had no children, and God had promised <coughs> them, you're going to have children, and you're going to have many. <coughs> you had many children, but they were barren, they were already old, it's actually humanly speaking ridiculous to even let your heart hope for another child. And when they were getting impatient, God comes to them and sort of picks up this promise he made, and he says these words, and they're relevant for us as New Testament people too. And the word of the Lord came to Abraham, this man, Eliezer, your servant, who he thought was maybe God's plan B, one of his staff, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. So God doubles down on his promise. And he said, he took him outside and he said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can. <laughs> and then he said, so shall your offspring be. <laughs> Abraham believed the Lord, as crazy as that must have been. And God credited to him as righteousness. So the New Testament, after Jesus had died and <coughs> sacrificed himself in that sense on the cross, his life wasn't taken, he yielded it. Paul then explains to us, understand then, in Galatians 3, the passage is there, that those who have faith are justified, uh, are children of Abraham, sorry, those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So I bring this text up because of Jesus' remarks in John 12. Why? Let's go back and just check that out again. How did this old story start? Let me start with the seed. It said, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. Traditionally, Greeks had no business worshiping at the festival. They weren't ethnically, they weren't biologically Jewish background, but they came up to worship at the Jewish festival in Jerusalem. Who knows how far they traveled? That's the context. They come to Philip, who's from Bethsaida, and they request her, we'd like to see Jesus. Philip tells Andrew, Andrew and Philip, go to Jesus. And then he says, the hour is coming. I think that's what this is talking about. Mm -hmm. That the nations have come. This is the moment. Salvation history, everything God has been planning, is now like right ready to burst into fruitfulness. Yes, God selected Abraham. Yes, he selected his family to bless the world. And Jesus came through that family. But God had always planned to include people of every culture, every nation, every language, all the different families and clans, even those in conflict. Everyone is invited to this God who pays the penalty of sin with his own life. And so when these Greeks show up, Jesus says, it seems almost out of context, the hour has come. Somebody says, hey, I brought two people to you. I'd like to introduce them to you. You don't say, oh, the hour has come. <laughs> but Jesus did. <coughs> Because he's making something profound, a profound statement to his disciples. You know, in Canada, we have a lot of different cultures coming. You know that better than me. 
You're in multicultural mecca of the world here in Toronto. So many different nationalities, so many different amazing backgrounds, amazing stories, difficult stories for some. And Jesus has to point this out to his disciples, that this is what it's all about. This little event of foreigners coming and wanting to see Jesus, not just to experience a little bit of Jewish culture, beautiful as that may be, but they wanted to know about Jesus himself. And so I think in this passage here, we get a little bit of an indication of a growth in a young disciple that I trust God wants to also build up in people like you and me as disciples of God. Because this Philip, I don't know why he didn't just go to Jesus. He has to go and he, he grabs his brother. And we don't get any insight into his heart at that moment. Like, is he shy? Did he feel like, I don't know how to really speak to them because they speak Greek and they don't speak my language. I don't know what the reasoning was or what the issue was, but he got it done. Mm -hmm. He brought him to Jesus, but he took him. And it made me think about this same Philip years later in Acts 8, where again, with a foreigner, a man from northern Africa, maybe the corner of Egypt, God puts him in a situation where he can be with someone from another culture, sort of a bridge person. And I wonder whether these kinds of moments of interacting with people that traditionally weren't part of the focus group. And God put a sensitivity in his heart to notice somebody from another culture and to welcome them. Mm -hmm. And he comes alongside this African and he's sort of puzzled by a piece of scripture that he bought, it must have been super expensive, reading something from the prophet Isaiah, and he reads it and he explains it to him. And this man, through that conversation, out in the desert, it says, on the desert road, he comes to faith and he, he says, I, I want this Jesus in my life. I get it. I need him. This passage is talking about, I need exactly that. I need the God who is above all things and he gave his life to me. And God used this Philip. No brother, no other helpers at that moment. And he uses him like that. I think that's an amazing thing mm -hmm. and easily over, overlooked in this passage, but I think this hour that has come, as Jesus points out at that moment, is signifying exactly what a multicultural Toronto means. That God has given his best to welcome people from all cultures, all backgrounds, all paths of life too, into what he's doing in this world, to come to him. So I wonder, can that kind of sacrificial love, preparedness, to be used in God's purposes in this world, can that be learned? What do you think? I don't want a cheap, quick answer, I think. I want you to shade a little bit with me saying yes, I think it can be learned. I think that's what all these passages in the New Testament are talking about. When Scripture challenges us to love one another as Christ has loved us, that means we need to practice that. Here in this room, later at ping pong, or whatever we do, as we converse with people, pray with them over Zoom, or as we then connect with others, to learn to to incorporate, to emulate what we see God doing himself, and to learn from that. Jesus says here, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So I kind of want to just conclude with 
that service aspect. Where I am, my servant will also be. We know because he's the resurrected Lord that he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. We can speak to the Lord at any time. So in that sense, Jesus is everywhere. I don't think that's the part that this passage is talking about. But in your personal life and in mine, if you've given your life to Jesus, he's leading. He's leading from the front. If you listen to NFL announcers, football games, you hear people say, you know, he's a good captain. He he leads from the front. That means he goes ahead and others follow. There are also leaders, leadership types, that lead from the back, that can rally people and encourage people as they go forward. They don't necessarily need to be up front here with the mic. You find other ways to do that. That's cool. But Jesus here, he leads from the front. And the question is, are you the disciple? Are you coming with? Are you letting yourself be like the Philip that maybe takes some fearful steps and needs a help, needs an encouragement to go and bring someone to the Lord through conversation, whatever, but maybe also to be bold and to learn that God can use you wherever he's taking you. And again, I don't know where that is. I don't know where he's at in your life, but you want to be where he is. Where I am, my servant will also be. That's what, what we need. That's where I think that fruitfulness of getting to see that God maybe reaches into a life that's broken, that's hurt, and makes things whole. We get to see that. That's, that would, that's amazing. So I can't answer all these questions questions that we're going to look at later on and we'll look at in the groups, you kind of have to do that one on your own. It's not about the right answer. It's about, well, where is Jesus in my life? Where is he calling me? What is he asking me to maybe prioritize differently? Because he's got other ideas for me. But they're good ideas. And it's an amazing thing to get to be with him who both gave his life but also makes life we're going to bless you and encourage you in this power of the sea that you're going to uh, work in these things. Let's just pray briefly. Anyway, Father in heaven, I want to thank you for your son Jesus. As much we don't understand, we see as we scratch at the surface of your word here that there's great depth. There's so much love, a whole well of it that doesn't run dry. Lord, I pray that you help us to understand where you're at in our lives and where you want to take us, where you want us to be, how we can love, how we can serve, we can learn from you, that we need to be a blessing to the Greeks and the Iranians and the, the, the Germans and the Russians and the French, whoever's around us, Lord, people that don't know you, that we would get to be a part of this multiplication that you pursue and you put in motion. Bless us. Bless this place. Let everyone who comes here be encouraged in their hearts and be challenged in their lives to risk it with you, to trust that uh, you will make all things right even in their lives. We pray your blessing on this house and thank you for your, your powerful word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.